tonight we're looking at Psalms 146 and Psalm 147, and it's uh, appropriate as we're continuing and about to conclude our study in the Psalms uh, that we would look at these two Psalms. Actually, as we look at Psalm 146 to the conclusion of the Psalm, Psalm 150, these are what are called hallelujah or halal Psalms or praise Psalms. And what you're going to see, interestingly enough, as we go through these, and tonight we'll go through Psalms 146 and 147, and then we'll conclude our study of the Psalms by taking Psalms 148 through 150. But what you're going to be seeing as we study is that uh, the word praise the Lord, the words praise the Lord begin and conclude each one of these Psalms, and that's one of the reasons why these are called the Halal or Hallelujah Psalms. So beginning at verse 1 here in Psalm 146, reading to verse 10, uh, we read these words. The writer writes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. And so as I mentioned a moment ago, the last five psalms are psalms of praise because each one of them obviously begins and concludes with praise to God. And as I mentioned to you, uh, each psalm begins and ends with the words praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in the Hebrew is where we get the word hallelujah from. And that's how it begins and that's how it concludes. Now, something as I was preparing this today, something that I believe the Lord was laying on my heart that I wanted to share with you by way of introduction as we look at these two psalms uh, is that praising the Lord isn't something uh, that only those who are emotional are commanded to do. You know, there are some people who think, well, yes, of course you praise the Lord if you are of a certain denominational stripe. You should praise the Lord, for example, if you're, you know, just given to expressive worship, like in the Pentecostal tradition and all. And some people will do that, and they'll say, well, yeah, Pentecostals will praise the Lord and all, and they, they get worked up as they do so. But, but me, I'm not quite into that. You know, I praise the Lord in my own way. You know, and so you look at them as they're worshiping the Lord, and they're kind of going like this. I mean, there's just no real exuberance to their worship whatsoever. For them, they're going crazy if they go like that one time during worship. They go, oh, my goodness, you know, I've become a Pentecostal. There are some some people like that who don't understand very well that worship the Lord is not something that a certain denominational stripe is supposed to do and be known by, but God has called us all to worship Him. God has called all of us to praise Him, to give Him thanks for all that He has done and all of that. And I believe that that praise is an aspect of the worship that God has called for us to, to give to Him. One of the things that I've discovered about worship, and I want to lay this down as a foundation as we go through this, one of the things about worship is that it reveals two things about our relationship with the Lord. You might want to note these things. It, it reveals two things. One, it reveals the friendship of God, and it also reveals to us our fear of God. Our, our friendship with God and our fear of God is revealed as we worship the Lord. Throughout the Bible, you will note that some of the greatest saints that this world has ever seen, some of the greatest men and women who have ever lived, were humble people who feared God and had a friendship with God. When you look in the Old Testament and you see the relationship that men like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had with the Lord, when you see men like Moses and Joshua, men like David and Job and Isaiah, all of those men had tremendous reverence of God. When you think of Moses, when Moses encounters the Lord there at the burning bush, and you think concerning how that he drew near to this bush that was aflame and yet was not consumed, and, and how the Lord spoke to him and said, remove your shoes, because the ground that you are standing on is holy ground. It reveals the awe that he had as it relates to God and God's introduction to him, and yet later on we see in the life of Moses that he was a companion and very close to the Lord. God even went so far as to say that he spoke to, to Moses face to face. There was the fear that he had of the Lord, but there was also the friendship that he had with him. 
You look at Isaiah in the first five chapters of the book of Isaiah, you see Isaiah revealing his ministry, speaking concerning the condition of man. The fifth chapter of Isaiah, he, can, he continually gives to us woes that God has given to the world uh, for their lack of faith and relationship with God. But, but when you arrive to the sixth chapter of the book of Isaiah, you notice that God is revealed to him in a very special way, and, and he reveals that to us in chapter 6 of Isaiah when he says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and he was lifted up. And his train filled the temple, and he begins to describe what he experienced there as God revealed himself to him. And, and whereas before there in chapter 5, he was pronouncing woes to man, in chapter 6, he pronounces a woe upon himself. Woe is me. He says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips. And yet God uses Isaiah in a tremendous way. And you see in his worship of God that there's a fear, there's a reverence, there's a holy awe that he has of the Lord, and yet there's also the friendship. I believe that worship is composed of at least those two elements. You have fear and you have friendship. You look into the New Testament, you see similar things. I think one of the, the greatest examples of this is the Apostle Peter. In the life of the Apostle Peter, he is one who had a tremendous love for and service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the Lord was beginning to minister, we see it in, in Luke chapter 5, when the Lord was beginning to minister, on one occasion he had, uh, he had told the, uh, the apostle Peter who was there uh, working on his nets and all, he'd been working all night and, uh, and all, the Lord Jesus said, would you uh, allow me to climb in your boat and, and set it away from the shore for a bit uh, so that I might share the word with these people? And as he does so and he concludes, Jesus concludes his message to the people who are there, he turns to the apostle Peter and he says to him, uh, why don't you set off and, and go on out there and let's do a little fishing. And, uh, and the apostle Peter, uh, an experienced fisherman, a businessman, looks at the Lord Jesus Christ and, and begins to correct him. You know, Jesus was only a preacher. What do preachers know? I mean, even to this day, people think the same way about Pastor Jesus. What do you really know about life? I mean, all you do is play golf and then come out once in a while and talk to us. You know, and so that's how kind of the apostle Peter was. And he's an experienced fisherman, and he knows that you don't go fishing during the day because you drop your nets and the fish see the nets, and what's the point of doing something like that? And that's why he says to the Lord, Master, we, we fished all night and we caught nothing. In other words, I want to correct you. You're an itinerant preacher. You're really not familiar with my occupation. I'm the expert. You're really a novice. Let me explain to you some facts about life. I've been working all night at my trade. I'm a businessman. I have partners. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, but nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the nets. And as he does so, the Bible tells us that an incredible draft or catch of fish, uh, he, he experiences that, and, and then he turns and he looks at the Lord Jesus Christ, and as he does so, he says something that I think is very important. It's found in Luke chapter 5, verse 8. He simply says to Jesus as he fell at his knees, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me. There's that fear. There's that sense of fear that he had, and yet we know that the apostle Peter later on, after he had failed the Lord Jesus Christ, denying him three times, and is being restored, we know that this, this kind of incident once again is, is triggering his memory because when he's there uh, and um, he's with the men and, and the Lord Jesus Christ is on the shore and he and, and the boys are out there fishing, we know in that particular portion of Scripture that Jesus calls out across the, the Sea of Galilee to the men and he says, boys, have you caught anything? And, and, and one of them, and I believe it was John, says, it's the Lord. And the apostle Peter jumps in the water and makes his way to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus and he have a face-to-face -face conversation there in the firelight as Jesus is uh, roasting some fish for them. And Jesus begins to ask those questions we're all familiar with when he says, Peter, do you love me? You know, are you my friend? I believe worship is, 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 is reverence. And, and worship is friendship. It's a combination of the two. And that's something that we do when we worship the Lord. We, we, we have a, a holy awe of Him, and we also have a fellowship with Him. And, and, and I believe that this is a simultaneous experience. We need to be careful that we don't reduce the Lord to something that is manageable. I was talking to my wife, Marie, the other day, and in C.S. Lewis's books, The Chronicles of Narnia, there's a Christ, uh, the Christ of that particular series. It was written as a children's series, but it has some very good lessons for, for older believers. Uh, there's this lion there that's named Aslan, and throughout the book you will hear that Aslan is not a tame lion. He's not a tame lion. You don't domesticate Jesus Christ. 
You don't reduce him to something you can manage. Worship is an awareness of what he is. There's a, uh, there's a, a sense of, of awe, that the holy fear that we have. As you see, the fear of the world will drive you away from something. You run away from something in fear. But reverential fear or awe actually has a tendency of drawing you to the Lord. And when you have that relationship with God and you have this awe, you're actually drawn to him. And as you're drawn to the Lord, you're experiencing fellowship with him. We have a tendency in our society, though, to not understand this. This is one of the reasons why people don't understand worship very well, because we have uh, this ability to domesticate that which is holy. And so it's, it's uh, you know, it's around Easter, and so we have taken the awe of, uh, of uh, an open uh, a tomb with, a, with no body, and we've, we've uh, substituted a bunny rabbit for that particular season. Or, or we have stuffed angels, uh, and, and uh, we have little dolls in mangers, you know, during Christmas. We forget about uh, the wise men, and we forget about the awe of the shepherds, and we replace them with, with uh, wolves and uh, elves and an overweight uh, man in a red suit. We have a tendency of doing that. And so we have basically taken what is holy and reduced it to mundane. In the Old Testament, the word worship... Uh, most often when it's used, means to bow down in reverence and submission. Uh, that's what it means when they're worshiping the Lord. In the New Testament, the, the Greek word proskuneo simply means to, to draw close to and, and, uh, and to kiss. It speaks of this face-to-face -face relationship with God. And so in the old as well as the new, you have both of those, those uh, elements of worship. You have awe, submission, you have fear, but you have friendship. You see that in the old as well as the New Testament. And worship and praise to God is best when we combine both, both of those elements, when we combine the awe and we, we combine the, uh, the friendship. In Psalm 25, verse 14, the Bible says the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him. The word secret speaks of that which is intimate, an intimate conversation with a friend. And so friendship and fear go hand in hand in Scripture. And so if we're going to worship the Lord, we need to come before the Lord with that mentality. And that's what's taking place here in Psalm 146 when we're called to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, he says in verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Now, some would ask the question, why, why would I waste my time praising the Lord? Why do you call me to do such a thing? The, the very first line here, praise the Lord, is really a call to community for people to, to raise their, their voices to God. But some ask, well, why should I? It reminds me of Job 21.15, which reads, Who is the Almighty that we should serve Him? What profit do we have if we pray to Him? There are many people today who want to know what they're going to get out of it if they do it. Rather than giving to Him that which is His, we want to somehow profit ourselves, But the bottom line is, for a believer, worship and praise is a response to his goodness to us. The Bible tells us in Psalm 100, verse 5, the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. And so there's a call. There's a call to worship. And I want you to know, one, that the call also includes everybody. In other words, it's a community call to worship. He's calling everybody to worship and praise the Lord. In our day, when we talk about our personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and indeed we all should have that, that personal, intimate knowledge of God on a level that is personal, meaning I do know God, not just things about Him. In a day that we have so much uh, stress on having a personal relationship with the Lord, we need to remember that this relationship with God is not lived in a vacuum. Our relationship with God is lived out in a community, and the community is called the church. And so we have a relationship with others who are brothers and sisters who love him and have the same knowledge of his salvation. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. When he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, he's not speaking just individually. He's speaking of the community. That's why you teach, and that's why you admonish one another in psalms. That's why you do that, because worship is something that we as a community are to do. But not only do we have a community of worshipers, but individually we worship the Lord. That's why he says, praise the Lord, O my soul. 
While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. So I praise the Lord individually as well as in community. Like he says in Psalm 86, 12, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forevermore. I'm making a decision, in other words, that I will be a worshiper of God. Now, there are many things in this world that will draw my attention and, and call for me to give it my time and my talent and my, and my finances and everything else. There are many things calling me to, to give those things over. To it, to it, whatever it may be. That's why he says in verse 3 and 4, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there's no help. His spirit departs. He returns to his earth, and that very day his plans perish. So no lasting help can come from any human being. That word help there, when he says, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. That word help there in the Hebrew language speaks of that which is delivering you. It speaks of salvation. He's saying no lasting deliverance or salvation comes from any person. What this is is a call to renounce humanism. It's a call to center your life in the pursuit of God. It's a call to have a purpose in your life that is centered on pursuing the Lord with all of your strength. He says that man cannot save you. Well, why is that? Well, it's because they ultimately die. Their bodies return to the dust. The Bible makes that clear throughout the Scriptures. For example, Genesis chapter 3, in verse 19, when God is pronouncing a curse, He says, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Ecclesiastes 3.20 says, All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all return to dust. Ecclesiastes 12.7, The dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Man cannot save you, so trust the Lord. Now notice what he says, In that very day his plans perish. The fact is that when a man dies, all his help goes with him. So we don't trust in dead philosophers. We don't trust in so-called religious leaders. What we trust in is the living Savior, the one who ever lives, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1.18, Jesus speaking, says, I am he who lives and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. So rather than trusting in princes or trusting in the Son of Man with, with whom there is no help, well, we trust in the Lord who is going to provide that for us. Verse 5, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food for the hungry, to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. So happy is the one who has the God of Jacob for his help. In contrast to the temporary help that man can give, we are called on to trust in the Lord. He's our help. He's our hope. And that's because he's all-powerful, he's true, he's just, and he's compassionate. Now, there's a, a verse here in verse 7, the last portion. I want to uh, point something out very, very briefly here. Note, notice how it says, the Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. God is the one who opens the eyes of the blind. God is the one who raises those who are bowed down. And God is the one who gives freedom to those who are in bondage. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, very famous portion of Scripture, Jesus is speaking there. And he says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord Jesus Christ has given us an invitation he is saying very simply this, I can give you the rest and the peace that you're pursuing and so desirous of. I can give it to you. But you have to come unto me. That's an invitation that he gives. 
And he's simply saying to us, if you will come to me, I will give you the things that you're lacking. Because life is, is filled with burdens, and life can be very, very tough, and there can be quite a bit of struggles in it. We all know that. But the Lord is making it very, very clear that he is the one who can set us free. Jesus said something interestingly. He said a person who sins becomes a slave to that sin. And that's absolutely true. And he says, and because they're a slave to that sin, obviously they're not experiencing the freedom that comes through knowing his truth. So the truth will set you free, but sin keeps you in bondage. Jesus Christ came in order to deliver the prisoners. To those who are more than willing to say, I'm tired, I'm lonely, I'm, I'm without communication, isolated, I'm in need. And one of the greatest problems people have is simply admitting that. And the funny thing about that is when you're young, you might begin to think, well, when I get older, I'll get religious. But when you're old, you begin to think you've tried everything and nothing has worked. I believe very strongly that the Lord is still in the business of delivering the prisoner. That's what the Word of God says very clear. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. Some of us have testimonies that we could, if I gave you an opportunity, we could stand up and each one of us could say, this is where I was and this is what I was going through and this is what I experienced and this is the fruit of that and this is what penalties I was paying for it and this is my life before I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when you opened your heart up to the Lord, he began to set you free. You know, for me, it was, you know, one thing for you, it's something else, whatever that was that had you in bondage. But the Lord Jesus Christ set us free. The Lord Jesus Christ, through his word, through his truth, by his spirit, took us from that bondage that we at one time found ourselves ensnared by and broke the chains and gave us freedom. That's what the Lord came to do. And some of us in this room, perhaps even tonight, are still in chains and still in bondage. But the promise is still there for you. The Lord can and will set you free if you but ask. Now, the Bible tells us in verse 8, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous and watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widow, but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The word wicked speaks of somebody who is a criminal, the guilty one, the one who is guilty of sin. Wickedness in Scripture very often is just another way of speaking of a hostility toward God. And the point he's making is that he frustrates the plans of those who oppose and hate him. Job 5 verse 12 says that God frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. And so the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. And finally in verse 10, the Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. So he begins with the words, praise the Lord, and he concludes, praise the Lord. Psalm 147, verse 1. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens that cry. He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. Praise the, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. He makes peace in your borders fills you with the finest wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters the frost like ashes. He casts out his hail like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. So Psalm 147, another song of praise. 
praise to God. He's saying that praising the Lord is right because God deserves it, and God blesses those who praise him. He says praise is beautiful because, uh, because praise is proper as you give it to the Lord. Now, in verse 2, notice how he says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. These are things to praise the Lord for. If you took, take notes, the word restoration fits right here. Why do you want to praise the Lord? I praise the Lord because he restores. I praise the Lord because he builds. I praise the Lord because he gathers. I praise the Lord because he heals. And I praise the Lord because he binds up what has been broken. I praise the Lord because he's restoring Israel. He brought back the exiles, both past, present, and will continue to do so in the future. But as verse 3 says, he heals and he binds up those who are brokenhearted. I believe very strongly, and I'm going to try and make this as practical as I can at this point here. I believe very strongly in the fact that the Lord because he's a wounded healer, I believe very strongly that the Lord has the ability to not only understand what I go through and what you go through, but to also heal. And I believe that he heals the brokenhearted. As a matter of fact, that's part of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple of portions of Scripture. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 4. I want to show you a couple of things. As you're turning to your Bibles there, a couple of thoughts. I'm going to be given the opportunity in a couple of weeks, and I would ask, if you remember, I would ask you to please keep me in prayer. I'm, I've been given the privilege and the opportunity to share at the National Calvary Chapel Pastors Conference that's taking place in June. And... Um, what we're going to be doing this year at our pastor's conference is uh, we're going to be taking the uh, seven churches of Revelations, uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3. And the speakers who will be sharing with the national pastors, it's a senior pastor's conference, have each been given one of the churches. There are several speakers, and some of them are sharing the same portion of Scripture, but different emphases. I have been asked to teach, and I'll be teaching on a Tuesday morning, I've been asked to teach on the Church of Smyrna. The Church of Smyrna is the persecuted church. You find that in Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And the word Smyrna is really a derivative from the word myrrh, and the word myrrh uh, speaks concerning um, something that was produced, a fragrance that was produced by being crushed. And when the Lord Jesus Christ is commending the Church of Smyrna, He's commending them because they're a church that is going through affliction and persecution. And one of the things that the Lord has been laying on my heart concerning this has been that as I observe the church in the United States, and I have opportunities to travel and, and, and uh, to see this, plus that's just part of the nature of what I do as a pastor. Uh, I do a lot of reading, and I look into a lot of things. And, and one of the things that I look into is the condition of the church and all, and I've had opportunity, as you know, to travel not just through the states, through internationally, and I've seen the condition of the church in a variety of places. And if there's one thing that I really believe very strongly is that the American church is, in some areas, as a matter of fact, I would say, to broad, broad brush it, uh, in many ways, is, is not really aware of, the, uh, of, of the, what affliction will do in a person's life. I don't know how to, how to say this, and I'm really grappling with it because even right now as I'm trying to share with this, this with you, it, it may not make sense to you. But there is so much today that is being presented concerning Christian faith that is just inaccurate because it's not given a complete picture. I think that's one of the reasons why my heart gravitated to that song held because it gave to me uh, words that really speak more of the human condition. So many times what we're looking for is we're looking for easy answers, quick solutions with as little pain as possible. 
But what we end up being is extremely shallow because we are constantly trying to get around the lessons that would actually test our character, prove our character, and produce a character. And one of the things that I've discovered in my own life, especially in the last several years, is that God will take those things that are painful in your life and will weave them into your character and produce in you the kind of personhood that you desire to have. When you look at Isaiah 53 and you understand that that's a prophetic portion of Scripture relating to Jesus Christ, you understand that it's speaking about that one whom we refer to as the wounded healer because the Lord Jesus Christ was despised and rejected and you see that reality in him and then you see that lived out in the rejection of Christ and the crucifixion. And it begins to awaken you to the reality of suffering and affliction and what it produces in a person. Jesus Christ came, and one of the things he intended to do was to bind up the wounds of those who were broken. According to Luke chapter 4, you're probably wondering, am I ever going to speak about it? Yes. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, 18 to 21. Jesus is speaking here. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the door, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today the Scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus said, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, and he will do that. The Lord does that. There have been things in your life and in my life that have caused me to feel like, Lord, there's how much further can I go? One of the things I've shared with you often, those of you who are part of this fellowship, that the Lord gave to me many years ago was found in the Gospel of John when the Lord Jesus Christ had uh, done some ministry and as he had done this particular ministry, he began to share to the people, share with the people and say to them, unless you eat the Son of Man's flesh and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And as he's saying that to those would-be disciples, they begin to respond by saying, this is a difficult saying, who can understand it? And as they were listening to the Lord and they heard the pronouncements he was making, they turned and they began to walk away. And as Jesus is there with his disciples, he sees all of these people who at one time were standing there listening, but now they've turned and they're walking away. And as they're walking away, Jesus turns and looks at his disciples and he, and he, and he, he asks them a question, do you want to go away too? Do you want to go away also? And I've shared this with you before because I believe very strongly that in one form or another, over a lifetime of walking with the Lord, you will hear that question yourself. There will be circumstances. There will be a situation. There will be a problem. There's going to be something that is so incredibly difficult to deal with that you might hear the voice of the Lord speak into your heart asking that question to you. Do you want to abandon me too? Is this a difficult thing to understand? Is this something that you can't relate to? It's like when John the Baptist is in prison. He's about to lose his head. He hears of the ministry of Jesus Christ. It doesn't in any way go along with what he thought Jesus was supposed to do because when Jesus first came out and began to preach, his message was the same as John's. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But Jesus seems to be doing things a bit differently now, and so because I'm going to lose my head, I would like to know for sure that I'm losing it for the right person. So he sends a couple of his boys to speak to Jesus and ask, are you the coming one or should we look for another? And as he's asking that question, the fact is, he's simply saying, listen, I know that uh, I baptized you, and I know that the Spirit descended and remained on you, and I know that the Heavenly Father said to me, the one whom you see the Spirit uh, by, uh, uh, lighting on and remaining, this is he. Now, I pointed you out, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, but you need to understand something. I'm about to lose my head, and I'm here in prison. I'm alone, and I'm simply wondering, are you the one that I said you were? Because if I lose my head for the wrong person, that's not a good thing. So are you the coming one? I believe that you can get to the point in your life where you begin to wonder, did I make 
the right decision in my life to yield my life to this one because he's different than I thought he was supposed to be. I thought when I got saved, I'd never have another problem again. I thought that this Holy Ghost smile that I had, this joy of, of having my sins forgiven would last forever. I didn't realize that I still had to live in this world. I thought I could be basically transported out of it and that I'd be kept from pain and kept from affliction and kept from suffering and the sorrows of life. And I'm discovering that my mom doesn't like me much, didn't before but hates me now. My dad didn't really care that much. My brother didn't like. My sisters are having a difficult time with me. Grandma won't even sit with me at Thanksgiving. What happened? What's going on in my life? Are you the coming one or should I look for another? Jesus turns to his boys and says that to them. Do you also want to go away? Jesus Christ came to heal the brokenhearted. And that broken heart can occur even after you've been saved. Sometimes we think, well, yes, all my brokenness and my brokenheartedness, well, that occurred before I got saved. That's why I got saved. But some of you have discovered that even after being saved, your heart can be broken and broken and broken again in various ways, various disappointments, various sorrows, various rejections, just a variety of ways. And as I've been growing older in the Lord now, I've discovered that He heals every broken heart, that He's there no matter what happens. And, and, and when that which was most precious to you is suddenly gone, He never is gone. He has said, I will never, never, never leave you nor forsake you. Though your mom or your dad or, or that, that boyfriend or that girlfriend, a brother, a sister, even a husband or a wife, a child, a grandchild, dear friend, though they can turn and say, you know what, we were friends once or close once, but you know what, it's gone. I have nothing for you anymore. We've got to just stop hanging around or we've got to stop being married or I'm not going to see you anymore. That does happen. If I were to ask some of you broken-hearted Christians out here, could you stand up and could you say what broke your heart? Well, many could stand up and say, I lost my baby. Somebody can stand up and say, I lost my child. Somebody can stand up and say, I lost my job and I haven't been able to find... I mean, we all have relationships that have been broken. Our hearts have been broken. But Jesus Christ has come so that he might heal the broken-hearted. And that's what the Word of God teaches us. You know, in 2 Corinthians, in, in, in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the apostle Paul writing there said this, Paul said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. He heals and he binds up those who have been broken because he is the God of all comfort. And he continually does that. And turning on back to the Psalms, Psalm 147, he says in verse 4, he counts the number of the stars, he calls them all by name. Great is our our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked down to the ground. Why praise the Lord? Well, he says, take a look at the magnitude of the universe and consider the greatness of God because it's God who created the stars. It's God who sustains them. It's God who keeps the entire universe together. Notice how verse 6 says, the Lord lifts up the humble and casts the wicked to the ground. If he keeps the universe together, he can keep you together too, is the point he's making. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8, the Bible says that God raises the poor from the dust, lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. But the sad fact is those who refuse to humble themselves before God will be humbled by him. 
In verse 7, continuing, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises on the harp to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to grow on the mountains. He gives to the beast its food and to the young ravens that cry. And so he speaks of praise. He's, and notice with me in verse 7, how he says, sing with thanksgiving and sing praises on the harp to our God. I don't need to go into this very often or very deeply. All of you know this. The Lord, uh, you know, we can worship the Lord with the musical instruments. What is common today for everyone in this room wasn't common even 35 years ago, though. 35 years ago, when you had guitar players up here in, in, in an altar, I mean, that was absolutely taboo. When I first got saved, I was amazed. I went to Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, and it was where Maranatha music sprung from, and contemporary Christian music was very big. And, and, uh, and I was amazed because I had been invited to go to a Bible study, and I was 19 at the time, and I was invited to go to a Bible study, and, and I wasn't a believer. It was the summer of 1970. I was 19, almost 20, and I was invited to go to a Bible study, as you know. I've shared this with you before. And, um, and I didn't want to go to church. I said, why would I go to church, man? I don't desire to go to church. I had been raised a Roman Catholic. Why do I want to go to your rinky-dink Protestant church anyway? And I just had no desire to do that. And my friends constantly invited me to go, and I constantly rejected. And then finally I said, look it, I'll go. You know, if you get off my back, I'll go one time. And that's when I was a hippie and all of that. So I smoked some pot and I drank some beer and I went to church. And, and when I went to church, I'm thinking for sure because I'm barefooted, I've got the long hair and all of that. I was positive when I walk in that, in that door of that church because if I did this at the Catholic church, I mean, the usher would have thrown me right out, you know. So I know that when I walk in barefooted with the long hair and my eyes are all bloodshot and I smell like beer, I just know for sure that those people are going to kick me out. The hypocrites will do that. And then I can point to my, my friend and say, this is why I don't go to church because of all these weirdos and, and, and all of that. And, and man, when I got to the church, you know, they're, they're up there playing music that I could understand, you know, and I'm, I'm waiting for a 95-year-old woman with a beehive and funky glasses to start playing the organ, and that does not happen. And I'm thinking, boy, something's wrong here, you know, I don't get this. And some guy comes up with an acoustic guitar and begins to sing, and as he's singing, I know the song. He had taken a song at that time and changed some of the words and started singing it to the Lord, and I was thinking, this is, this is odd, man. I, I, I like this, you know, and because I really thought that when I walked in, they'd throw me out. But when the guy came out to teach the Bible study, his name was Lonnie. When Lonnie came out to teach the Bible study, he was freakier than I was. And as I look at this freaky guy up there, I thought, man, there's something wrong with a church like this. I like it, and they accept people like me. And so the bottom line was, as I discovered very early that, uh, that worship to the Lord didn't have to be done in a certain sense, in the sense of that you have to have a certain, like a pipe organ and a warbly voice. I mean, worship to the Lord can actually be okay, enjoyable. And, uh, but I became an assistant pastor, and we were renting a church, and, and they said to us, uh, when you do worship, you can't use guitars. If you use guitars, you have to go into the fellowship hall. You cannot use guitars in the main sanctuary. And I thought, how interesting is this, that the Lord do doesn't go into the fellowship hall. He just hangs around in the sanctuary. It made no sense to me whatsoever. And yet, the Bible tells us that we praise the Lord. We give Him thanks. We sing praises and musical instruments. That's what verse 7 speaks about. Why do we do that? Because God is in control over the entire universe. His power and His provision, His provision with rain and food, cause us to be thankful to Him. That's why. In verse 10, He does not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man, especially if they're my legs. Uh, the Lord takes pleasure in those. It's illegal for me to wear shorts in the state of California. <laughs> the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him, in those who hope in His mercy. The ultimate faith is not to be in military strength. That's the point he's making when he says he does need not delight in the strength of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. Is simply saying that we do not put trust in human power. We put trust in the Lord. Verse 12, praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates. He has blessed your children within you. He makes peace in your borders, fills you with the finest wheat. We bless the Lord because he gives us the ability to live in peace. That's what it means in verse 14. He makes peace in your borders. Verse 15, he sends out his command to the earth. His word runs very swiftly. He gives snow like wool, scatters the frost like ashes, casts out his hail like morsels, 
Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow and the waters flow. So basically all nature is subject unto him. He speaks and nature must listen. And then finally, verses 19 and 20, and this is very important. I'll spend a couple moments and we'll close. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation, and as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise the Lord. Now, let me close with something that I don't want to get past you just by just closing briefly and praying. I want you to see something because it's extremely valuable. As a matter of fact, to be honest with you, I'll be leaving on Friday, returning Saturday, to do a men's conference in Sacramento. The subject that I've been given is found in John 15, and the verse that I'm using is verse 3, where it speaks concerning the Word of God cleansing you. And so this is fresh on my mind. I'm not going to give to you a 40-minute study right now. I'll save that for Saturday. But I will say this, and it's extremely important, and therefore I'll say it to you very briefly. In verse 19 and 20, he declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known him, praise the Lord. They have not known them, praise the Lord. Israel had the blessing of actually receiving the very word of God. No other nations had that given to them. That's the point he's making. He's saying Israel has been blessed by God with his word. And if there's anything today that I believe the church is lacking in, it's a love for the word of God. Listen, when Pastor Chuck began to teach word, the word of God in his church verse by verse, that was absolutely novel. And people would show up for Bible studies and fill up that sanctuary every time the doors were open because they actually, people like me at the age of 20 when I started going there, actually wanted to get a Bible study. We would go to Bible study on the midweek. I believe it was a Wednesday night youth study. And we'd come home from Calvary Costa Mesa and we'd go to my friend's house who lived in La Habra. And as we went to his house after Bible study, we would be in his front room and there would be a grip of us. There'd be 10, 15, 20 kids. And as we were there in the front room, we would sit in a large circle, we'd turn the lights low, and we would begin to worship God in song. Now, none of us were quote-unquote worship leaders. None of us really knew how to play guitars, and none of us could really sing very well. But that's what we would do. And we would sing all the songs that we'd been singing that night. I can still remember when I first got saved, there weren't stations like KKLA, and the, you didn't have K-Wave, and so many of what we have today and take for granted. I mean, you get up and you can, you can turn the radio on when you're driving. You can hear some of the finest teaching uh, that you'll ever hear just by turning the radio on. Or if you want to hear some good music, you can hear the fish. There are various other stations you can play to have great music, and that's, not, that's, that's great. Not only that, you can get on the Internet and you can, you can listen to, to various Christian radio stations and programs. I do it all the time. You can buy XFM or Sirius Radio, and it has Christian channels, and you can saturate yourself in music. We didn't have it at that time. What we had, what was called Christian, was basically something that came out, right, you know, uh, XERB, I think it was, and Wolfman Jack used to be on this particular station. I don't even know if you know who he was. <laughs> Wolfman Jack. And then you'd hear some Pentecostal preachers screaming. It would be like at 9 o'clock on Sunday night, and you'd just hear some guy yelling and tambourines, and that was basically it. That was Christian radio. You didn't have those options. I can still remember I was driving. I was freshly saved. I'm driving my car. I had a 1962 Ford Falcon station wagon, painted the windows black. I had a peace flag in the back. I'm a hippie, and now I'm saved. And so I put all of these, these bumper stickers. The Bible's so good, you hate to put it down, and all kinds of little bumper stickers. And I was a Jesus freak and loving it. But I didn't have, you know, I had an AM radio, and I'm driving, and I'm saying, oh, Jesus, I can still remember. Oh, Jesus, I just want to worship you. I just want to praise you, Lord. And I I turn on the radio. I said, could you give me something to sing along with? And there's George Harrison, my sweet Lord. <laughs> and so I just kept hallelujah and said a Hare Krishna, and off I went. You know, that was our option. That's basically all we had. That's basically all we had. And so we are really spoiled now. We are so spoiled today. 
You can turn on the radio and hear some of the finest teaching in the world. You have option after option after option, Bible study after Bible study, and you can get to the point where you actually don't value it anymore. You become Bible gourmets. You get your bookmarkers, and you begin to pick your teeth, and you say, I heard Chuck say it better. That's the way we can do it. <laughs> you know? And it happens that way. You know, Greg Laurie, I heard Greg, and he was much better than that. And that's how people, people are. We do that. We compare instead of having a hunger for God's Word, just a hunger for it. And the point he's making is a very simple one. God gave His Word to Israel and didn't give His Word to anybody else. And the Bible is still the number one book, the bestseller in the nation. It's still the number one book that is being sold, but it's the number one book that is not read. There are a lot of people who know that they have the Bible, but they're not in love with the Word of God. I remember a young boy who was on his way to college, and his father was concerned because he knew he was going to a secular college, and his father would say to him, son, son, don't let them take uh, the book of Jonah from you. Don't let them take the book of Jonah from you. Because he knew that because of the great fish and all of that, that the, the professors there were going to start saying all of that's mythology, couldn't have happened, no fish could swallow a man and all. Don't let them take the book of Jonah from you, son. So the boy goes off to college. He comes back after four years, and the father's sitting with him in the den, and he says, Son, did they take the book of Jonah from you? And the boy said, Dad, the book of Jonah is not even in the Bible. He said, I knew it. I knew it. They took the, bo the book of Jonah from me. Dad, I'm telling you, the book of Jonah is not even in the Bible. Yes, it is. Dad, the book of Jonah is not even in the Bible. So the man goes and grabs his Bible, and he opens it up to show his son, yes, it is, and he can't find the book of Jonah. So he says to his son, I can't find And the boy says, you know, Dad, four years ago when I went to college and you said don't let him take the book of Jonah from me, he said, I went and I took your Bible and I cut it out. <laughs> he said, what difference does it make if the professor takes it from me or if you don't read it? What difference does it make? You don't have the book of Jonah either. See, the Word of God is something God gave to us for our good. Like, like, like Job says, you know, his word is more necessary than my daily food. It's what provides me with life, insight, strength. And Israel was given God's word. That's why Wednesday night Bible studies, as well as Sunday nights and the various times that we get together as a church, that's why they're so valuable. It's because I don't want to fall into the trap of being a once-a-week Christian having somebody kind of like I'm a baby bird and somebody's a mama bird and they get that old worm up and chew it up and spit it down my throat once a week. I want to be feeding myself so that when I get a Bible study, it's adding to what I've already had the Lord giving to me, you see. So the nation of Israel was really, really blessed by the Word of God because it's God's Word that sets you free. It's a message that we're not ashamed of. It's a message that gives to us life.